Right, Reunion, we, uh, uh, for the last few weeks, have been making our way through uh, what is traditionally called the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found in two different parts of the New Testament. If you go to the very first book of the Bible in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, you would see in Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus talks about the Lord's Prayer. We've been looking at the version that is captured on the pages of the Gospel of Luke, particularly in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, was traditionally called the Lord's Prayer. And, and when you look at this, and I, I've gone with Luke's version because it's just a little bit more condensed and concise and tighter. And I like the nature of that for what we've been trying to do. And what you notice, even if you look at the version of it in Matthew 6, but also in Luke 4, it's clear to you that really the Lord's Prayer can be broken up into four different parts. Okay, And in the last few weeks, we've been taking the Lord's Prayer, looking at it part by part, portion by portion. And every part that we've looked at, we have always asked this question, um, what does it mean for us to pray this part of the Lord's Prayer? What does it look like for us to pray this part of the Lord's Prayer? So that's what we've been doing. Um, a few weeks ago, we looked at the very first part of the Lord's Prayer, Father, hallow your name and may your kingdom come. We looked at what it looks like for us to pray that part of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, two weeks ago, give us today each day our daily bread. What does that look like to pray that prayer? Last week we looked at this one, forgive us our sins for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Each week asking the question, what does it look like for us to pray this prayer in a very practical way? And uh, one of the things we've wrestled through each part of the Lord's Prayer is that we are really allowed and set free by Jesus to pray these prayers as simply as we want them to be prayed, as generally as we want them to be prayed. Um, now, there are moments, as we'll see again this morning, where Jesus colors it in a little bit more and fills it in a little more and allows us to be as expansive as we want to be in these prayers. But each week, we've just been making our way through this. And now, today, we come to the fourth and final part of the Lord's Prayer, which is this, and Father, lead us not into a time of testing. Lead us not into a time of testing. What does it look like for us to pray this part of the Lord's Prayer? Lead us not into a time of testing. What I'm going to do today is start in the same place that I've started in all the other weeks, which is, again, to invite you at the very least in the days ahead to pray this prayer as simply as you want to. What, what I've done so far in this series is I've taken a moment each week to distill the prayer of Jesus all the way down just to one word. If that's all you want to do is just pray one word, the first week, Father, move, if you remember. Just Father, move. Uh, two weeks ago, Father, give. You know, he knows our needs. We don't even need to voice him. Just sometimes, just start there. Father, give. Last week, Father, forgive. Remember, I said it's good to pray that generally because we're such a mess in our heads. We don't know what kind of a mess we really are. Well, this week, I would invite you at the very least to start out by praying this prayer very generally. There is nothing wrong with you simply praying this. Father, lead. Father, lead. Um, I don't think you need to color it in or fill it in any more than that if this is just simply where you want to start, that you start each day by simply praying, Father, lead. Or in particular, as you're looking at certain events that you think might be coming up in your day, to just simply pray, Father, lead. Like you don't even maybe know what to pray for in the leadership of God or how your day needs to unfold, so just simply pray, Father, lead. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to talk about how Jesus does take it a step further and says, now, I think there's some particular things that we should be praying about concerning the leadership of God in our lives and that we're allowed to pray about. But I do think if I were to distill this all the way down to just one simple prayer, and I would invite you to just start here, it's with the, the, the simple plea to God, lead, lead. I think this is the journey of the whole prayer that Jesus gives us in Luke chapter 11 in which we're crying out to God, I want to see your name be holy among the people and I want to see your kingdom, your rule and your reign, your really good and beautiful and perfect kingdom invade this world. Is there a better way for us to close out a prayer that includes that by saying, and so from here on, as I'm closing out this prayer, you just simply lead me forward in however you need to move to make that happen. Or we've cried out to God, give us this bread each day that we need or fill these needs. But then also then to, to close it all out with, you know what, Father, bottom line, just lead me. 
Help me understand the ways that you might be meeting those needs or I can partner with you in meeting those needs. Or we've just cried out to God about how we realize we are such a mess and we've sinned. What is better for us on the other side of that forgiveness than to close it out by simply saying, and so Father, in light of all of this, including that prayer for forgiveness, look, I'm a sinner, so just lead. Would you lead so that I don't keep stumbling into the same awful, unholy habits every day? There is... No more beautiful prayer you could pray to start your day at the close of your prayer time than simply this, Father, lead. Jesus is closing out this prayer time by saying, you know what, if anything, just stop and say, you know what, God, here are the reins to the day. Have it. You take the wheel, you take the reins, you do what you need to do as the day unfolds. Lead. It's a good thing for us to do because, quite frankly, we start every single day thinking, I'll take the lead from here. We are terrible followers of God as opposed to wanting to lead God in the direction we want him to go. And if you distill this all the way down, it's just Jesus simply saying, when you close out this prayer, say this, Father, lead, okay? So if we can't just generally pray this prayer, I would really encourage you to start there. If you don't want to go any further than that, that's still a good and beautiful prayer. In fact, that's going to cover everything that I'm about to say, <laughs> all right? It's really a good umbrella prayer. But I will go the step further in that I do think we're called to pray this prayer pretty particularly. And what I mean by that is the exact prayer that Jesus gives it where he colored it in a little bit more. Yeah, Father, lead. But in particular, Father, this is my prayer that you would lead me not into a time of testing. Lead me not into a time of testing. What do I mean by that? First and foremost, probably what I need to stop and do is to explain to you why what I have up on the screen looks different from what you might have in your Bible. Because you might be looking at that and saying, that doesn't match up with my translation, the Bible that's cracked open in my lap here this morning, or the one that you go through in the morning when you're doing some daily devotionals. Or a lot of us here grew up, you know, in, in church camp having to memorize the Lord's Prayer, and you would say, that is not the version of the Lord's Prayer that I memorized. Most of you memorized it. How? And Father, lead me not into temptation is how most of us memorize the Lord's Prayer and how almost all the translations out there have it as, Father, lead me not into temptations. I have it up there as, lead me not into a time of testing. So what gives, Brian? Why is your version so different than the one I memorized or the one that I read? Well, the reason why is, first of all, I, I'm perfectly appropriate in translating it that way. But then also, I think that is a better translation for it when I take into consideration the whole host of scripture and the stories within the Bible. The reason I say that it is appropriate for me to translate it if I want to and if you want to as a time of testing is because uh, maybe you know this, if not today's the day that you know this for the first time, the New Testament was written originally in the language of Greek. Uh, it was written in the time and recorded in the time of the Roman Empire. Greek was that commonwealth language that was out there. That's the version of the New Testament that we have is in Greek. And the Greek word that is used here in Luke chapter 11, verse 4, I know this is really technical, but it's important. The Greek word that's used there can be translated either as a time of testing or a time of temptation. Now, when you study Scripture and you look at stories in Scripture about people who have been tested, a definition of testing emerges over time, doesn't it? This is what a time of testing is according to what we see unfold in Scripture. A time of testing is when you find yourself in very difficult circumstances, and it is so that your faith in God and your faithfulness to God might be tried and ultimately strengthened. Is that not what we see when we rummage around in the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament? You think about the story of Abraham and Sarah when they're making their way to try and find this place that God would lead them. And the tests that they face are ones that God allows to unfold because it ultimately strengthens them, doesn't it? The waiting for a child, the waiting to find the nation, the dealing with oppressive nations around them. You go on and read the story of Joseph and the trials and the testings that strengthen him and make him the man God would have him to be. The trials and the testings of David which shape him in such a way that we read later that David was considered a man after God's own heart. Consider the testings and the trials of Jonah and how they strengthen him and set him loose in preaching. Consider the testings and the trials of Jesus. The testings and the trials of Paul. 
All of these things that sometimes they would pray that they would be held away from them and yet sometimes God would allow them to go into them because it strengthened their faith in God and their faithfulness to God. That is what a test or a trial is when you study scripture and you rummage around in the stories of scripture. Now when it comes to a time of temptation, what do we know to be true about scripture? That's when you're being oppressed. So that you might stumble into unholy behavior, creating distance between you and God, thus straining your faith to the point of breaking it. Now when you study scripture and you look at the activity of God in the lives of his people, you tell me what you think is the better translation for Luke 11 verse 4. Father, lead me not into temptation or lead me not into a time of testing. Because a time of testing, most consistently in Scripture, is what we give an account for what God is up to in our lives. That there are moments where he directly sends us into trying circumstances, or I would say also indirectly. And what I mean by that is sometimes he allows them to unfold. He doesn't step in supernaturally or specifically to stop it. But he allows these things sometimes to happen. And it's always so that we might be strengthened, our faith in him and our faithfulness to him. Now, now, now I, I know your question might still be, why do so many translations still go with temptation then? And the answer is really simple. It's because within any test or any trial, what's lurking there within them? Temptations. And so what happens is I think the translators just want to cut out the middleman. Let's just talk about temptation. Because we know if I go into a time of testing, there are going to be temptations within it. And so I can see why they translate it that way. Father, lead me not into a time of temptation. But then sometimes what bugs me about that is I think we are just really casting a terrible light on God as if he is against us and not for us. Like God's just moving chess pieces around to lay us low as opposed to the fact that the story of Scripture from beginning to end is that our God is for us. God will allow a time of testing Knowing very well at times that means there will be another one who is at work within that with temptations. So like for example, you go to a time of testing like job loss. There's going to be temptations within that. Job loss is a time of testing. There's temptations within that. There could be anger and division. I mean, when you lose a job and the divisiveness that happens, even jealousy for coworkers who get to keep their job and you don't get to keep yours. Or quite frankly, sometimes in the midst of job loss, there could be the threat of a loss of faith, thinking, I have cried out to God to provide for me. Give us each day our daily bread, and here I lose my job. I don't even know if you're there anymore, God. So yeah, there's, there are times of temptation. But overall, what I think we ought to look at this more than anything is to realize, I think, I know this would, this would be my translation of it. I know it's clunky, and no one asked me because I'm not smart enough to be on all the translation committees. But because of the relationship and the inner relationship of those words, I don't even want to divorce them from each other too much. This is how I would translate Luke 11, verse 4. And Father, lead us not into a time of testing, for we know times of testing carry within them many temptations. I'm making sense why I opt for a different translation on this. Lead me not into a time of testing because I know temptations rest within God. And so I come back to the question, what does it look like for us to pray this? Yeah, start out very generally and simply, Father, lead. But in particular, Jesus says, there is nothing wrong with you realizing that all people of faith face times of testing and trials. And there is nothing wrong with you praying to God as your day begins or even as your day ends or as you're looking ahead as what might very one unfold to simply say, you know what, Father, lead me. But I I'm going to pray this. Please lead me not into a time of testing because I know there's going to be temptations for me. I feel frail and I feel small. Now I know the pushback that I can get on this is, well, why would we pray against God leading us into a time of testing if by way of definition that's where we are strengthened, our faith in God and our faithfulness to God? Doesn't that seem really wrong for us to pray against that? In just a moment, I'm going to show you something that I hope helps address that a little bit. But at the very least, can I tell you this? Our doing this kind of prayer, Father, lead me not into a time of testing, is no more wrong than it was for Jesus to do it. And what I mean by that is it ain't wrong at all because Jesus did this. 
And we have to take really seriously that moment that's just piercing your heart in Mark chapter 14. You remember this? This was the night of his betrayal, and he goes to this garden called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. They took Peter and James and John along with them, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. And you know why? Because he knew he was about to enter into a time of testing. He sees it looming there in the distance, and he recognizes that holds within it profound opportunities for me to give into temptation. Hatred, loss of faith, violence, because he realizes if I want to, I can call on legions of angels to knock these people off the face of the earth with just the breath of these angels. Huge temptations rest within this time of trial. So he's deeply distressed and troubled. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. So stay here and keep watch. And going a little farther, he fell to the ground and he prayed God, if it's possible that the hour might pass from me, please. Father, he said, everything is possible for you. In other words, you can put an end to this time of testing that I see coming up. So if you can, will you take this cup from me? Cup being language and imagery in the ancient world that spoke to having to drink deep of something painful and destructive. Father, will you take this cup to me and yet not what I will, but what you will? Do you hear what Jesus is praying in Matthew 14? Father, if it is at all possible, lead me not into a time of testing. So sometimes we get really scared to pray this idea. Our doing it is no more wrong than Jesus doing it. In other words, there is nothing wrong with this. That when you see looming times of testing, there's nothing wrong with going before the Father. We are encouraged by Christ to go before the Father and say, I see some things lining up and it terrifies me, God. And if it be your will, lead me not into that time of testing. Because I'm frail, and I'm small, and I'm broken, and I don't know if I can stand. So yeah, I go that step further and say we should pray this. Father, lead me not into a time of testing. To pray this particularly, Father, lead me not into a time of testing. Will he answer that prayer? I don't know. It was one of those things when I do a sermon series on prayers, I can't possibly answer all the questions that you might have about it because I don't know all the prayers that you might be praying a lot of times it is a case-by-case -case basis where we just sit down as friends and we try and figure out what might God be telling us. It could very well be that he goes ahead, as we're going to talk about in just a moment, and send you right into a time of testing or indirectly allow you to step into a time of testing. Or it may very well be that he realizes your faith in him and your faithfulness to him will be strengthened by him delivering you out of that time of testing. All I know is that Jesus encourages us, there is nothing wrong with you praying, God, if it's possible, lead me not into that. Lead me not into that. But then, of course, we go a step further and we do realize, though, we do have to pray this prayer openly. <laughs> that even as we pray that, we have to be open to the very real reality that God might allow us to make our way into a time of testing. Because one of the things that we have to balance out in all of this is what is one of our most consistent prayers or what should be one of our most consistent prayers in life but this, Father, I want to grow in my understanding of who you are. I want to grow in my faith and my belief in you. I want to grow in my faithfulness to you. I want to look more like your son every day. That's really at the heart of all the Lord's prayer so far. Father, make your kingdom come. Make your name hallow in my life. God, give to me and forgive me and help me cease in my life. God, I want to grow. And so if we're praying that prayer, how did we define a time of testing? 
That's when you find yourself in difficult circumstances so that your faith in God and your faithfulness to God might be tried and ultimately strengthened. And so all at once, I'm praying, Father, I want to grow in my faith in you and my faithfulness to you, but Father, lead me not into a time of testing. And what we're going to have to realize is that second prayer needs to be prayed openly because God might not answer that second prayer in order that he might answer the first. Does that make sense? That God balances things out in that way, and in those moments, if there's one thing that I think is so beautiful about us praying boldly before God, lead me not into this time of testing, that if we find ourselves in that time of testing, we cannot help but really at the same time we are pained to realize that, to celebrate that we have just stepped into a time in which God consider us us strong enough to withstand it and in fact it will make us stronger. It's a fascinating statement by God about his faithfulness in us. And so we have to pray this openly because we know that when I step into these circumstances they are going to be miserable but on the other side of it. And this is the throng of teaching in the New Testament. Consider this in James 1, verses 2 and following. Consider it pure joy. It's just insane to me. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Trials, the same word that could be translated test. And here's why. Because you know that that testing of your faith produces perseverance. And you let that perseverance finish its work and you will be mature and complete, not lacking anything. He even goes further and says, blessed is the one who goes into these trials and perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Peter gets into this as well in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. In all of this, and he's talking about trials and the persecution of the church they were facing at the time of 1 Peter's writing. In all of this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials or tests. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. It's a beautiful image that we've talked about before in a past sermon and that the ancient workers with gold in that time, in order to make that gold as pure and as beautiful as it could be, they would put it in the midst of the great trial and test of fire and flame, heating it up to these high, high degrees to burn out impurities, to make it pure. And Peter goes, look, if that kind of process is being done for something that, yeah, I know it's worth a lot in this world, but really when it all comes down to it, it's all going to be done away with. Gold really doesn't even come close to how much you are worth. Then how much more is God at times going to allow you to go into times of testing that he might eliminate more impurities and strengthen that faith in him and that faithfulness to him? And so we pray this prayer openly open to God leading us into a time of testing. This is what I encourage you to pray. We've already done Father, lead. Father, lead me not into a time of testing, but Father, if such a time is going to grow me, this is a tough prayer. But Father, if such a time is going to grow me and set the world right just a little more, and so be it. And I add that little phrase and set the world right because one of the things that happens for us in times of testing is that when we see that looming in the distance and we're scared to death about having to step into that, we step away for it for very personal reasons. I don't want, I don't want to have to go through that even to grow. But at what point do we once again take very seriously that the calling of the Lord's prayer is not just about you? And it's not just about me. It's not just about I. But that maybe at some times God is, and this is hard, that God is weighing out how our time of testing is not just beneficial for us, but for our brother or our sister. Because one of the things that does fascinate me when you go through Scripture is how many times we see someone who is a faithful man or woman before God and they enter into a time of testing and they realize, oh, 
This wasn't just for my sake and my relationship with God, but for yours too. I mean, I can't help but think of the story many of us know, even if we didn't grow up in church, the story of Joseph. And you want to talk about a guy who had a miserable life of tests and trials. Brothers hate him, throw him in a pit, sell him into slavery. He goes into slavery, works his way up in that, eventually becomes the assistant to one of the leaders in the land of Egypt. And yet in that moment, that guy's wife accuses Joseph of trying to rape her. So then he's thrown into prison. This good, godly man thrown into trial after trial after trial. But do you remember that moment late in the chapters of Genesis where he meets back up with his brothers? And when he reveals to them who he is, which had to have been eight, terrifying moment for them because at that time he has all this authority he could say off with your heads yet one of the things he says to them as they stand before him on their knees weeping is what you meant as harm for me God has done for my own good and yours sometimes we enter into trials not just that we might grow but it sets the world right just a little bit more It's not a pleasant prayer to pray, but I think it's a prayer we need to pray, to be open. And when you pray it, I know that you can be terrified. Um, I'm terrified to prayer praise. I'm terrified when I realize I have to go into a time of testing because I know, again, remember the circles I do, there's temptations that lurk within. I know my weaknesses. I know my frailty. You know your weaknesses and your frailty. And what I encourage you to do is, once again, go another step further. Remember, we're doing that kind of margin release thing. More prayers, expansive prayers on this. You go a step further and say, Father, lead. We're going back to that idea, lead. But this in time, you lead me through this time of testing that I might not stumble into sin or be overcome by adversity, but rather my faith and faithfulness be strengthened and the world put right a little more. Pray for the protection of God. And pray it confidently that he will come through for you because you know maybe this other beautiful verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where Paul writes to us as a church, look, no time of testing. Now look, it's that same word and it brings the ideas of not just temptations but a time of testing wherein temptations lurk. So this is my own translation here. Paul says, look, no time of testing nor the temptations that lurk within that time has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. So what Paul is saying is you could very well, just like everybody else, go into certain times of testing. We all do, Paul says. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tested nor tempted within that time of testing beyond what you can bear. But when you are tested, and when you are then surely tempted in that time of testing, God will provide a way out so that you can endure it. Father, lead me not into a time of testing, but if you do, Father, you know, I'm I'm open to it, use it, but Father, protect me. And Father, I pray this confidently, that you will protect me, as you have promised in your word. It's another aspect of us praying this very openly is to have our eyes open to recognize where God is sending us different delivery systems out of these times of trials. It could be the whispered encouragement of a friend who has called you on the phone or sent you an email. It could be a hallway conversation. Um, It could be that just in the moment where you have felt like you have met your wit's end, you bump into something in God's word that you had no business being there because it wasn't a part of your reading plan. It could very well be that it's a sudden ceasefire to the trial or test that you're in. I don't know. I watched that happen with my mom for years. We, she was in this uh, work situation and, and this woman that she worked with literally in the same office was horrible to her for years. For years as a family, we would close out the day praying that God would change this woman's heart. And then all of a sudden one day, it just changed. So much so that my mom and her started eating lunch together every day, became friends. When this woman passed away a few years ago, my mom was put in charge of the funeral dinner. Would have never seen that coming for years. We prayed for God to deliver my mom from this situation. And one day, a sudden ceasefire. I don't know what might come your way, but I know the promises of God and his word in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And so we pray openly for God to move us forward in this prayer and I'll close with this 
We need to pray this prayer generally, particularly, and openly, and we need to do so widely. Here's what I mean by that, because again, I want to close out by coming back to this idea that we are not allowed to think the Lord's Prayer is just about me. We need to pray this prayer about God's protection from tests or within trials and tests. We need to pray this prayer generally and particularly and openly for our brothers and sisters around the world. Remember what I pointed out to you. I keep coming back to this. The pronouns are not singular in the Lord's Prayer and lead us not into a time of testing. Father, lead your church, your people, not into a time of testing. Now, does that mean that we pray certain things for our brothers and sisters in reunion when we pray this prayer? Absolutely. And there have been many moments where many of you have been going through different circumstances in your life where I have prayed for you the same prayer I pray for myself. God, if there's any way for you to spare them from this time of testing, I'm begging you for that. I've done that for a lot of you. And I'll continue to do that. I hope you do that for me. This is the prayer for us to be offering up, not just for ourselves and even just our own families, but for our family of God, the church. But I also think this is something very important for us globally. You know, it's always a fascinating thing. I try to be careful on this. I know we all have different opinions on this, but I do have to sometimes chuckle when we talk about, man, it's so hard to be a Christian in America. Sometimes I want to say, you know what it is? Be careful. You heard the last couple of weeks about what our brothers and sisters in Niger are going through? At least 45 churches burnt to the ground because of this stupid French cartoon thing. If their businesses and households that they identify as those belonging to Christians burnt to the ground. And what happens for us back here is we get mad about media coverage. Forget media coverage. Who cares? Now you know. Instead of getting upset about this, are we praying about it? When we see these headlines that spill across our screens and the things people put up on Facebook and Twitter, you know how hard it is for our brothers and sisters around the world. We get mad when we call Christmas trees holiday trees here. I think we're doing all right. Church is burnt to the ground in Niger. Father, I pray that you would lead them not into a time of testing. Are we praying for our brothers and sisters? Lead not our brothers and sisters around the world into a time of testing. But if such a time unfolds, lead them through this time of testing, God, that they might not stumble into sin or be overcome by adversity, but rather their faith and their faithfulness be strengthened in the world, put right a little more. Can we pray this prayer, not just for ourselves, but for our brothers and sisters around the world? We're going to go into a time of singing here in just a moment. And we're going to go into a time of communion. I come back to this beautiful moment again in that garden. It's beautiful, but it's piercing as well. Where Jesus falls on his knees before God and is crying out, Father, if, if there is any way, because I know all things are possible for you, God, if there is any way for you to take this cup from me, take this test from me, take this trial from me, do it. Now you notice that God did not answer the prayer in that way. But he makes his way forward into an intent, the most intense time of trial and testing any human being has ever faced. Yet to the very end, not my will, but your will be done, God. We celebrate that in communion. We celebrate the one who saw a time of testing and cried out to God, deliver me from that. But when God did not show forth the path for him to avoid this, he stepped not around it, right through it. We celebrate that at communion because that's how we have life. And communion is not just a time for us to remember what Jesus has done for us. It is, it is something strengthening for us when we are in the midst of our tests and our trials to take that bread 
and to take that in deep into us, the body of Christ who walked into that test. For us in tests and trials, we take that in and it carries us. We drink deep this juice that reminds us of this blood that was shed by the one who stepped into the test and that carries us. So we're going to sing a simple song that many of you have been singing since you were very little. I have decided to follow Jesus. It's a beautiful song for us to sing on this Sunday because uh, we have just talked about, you know what, there is going to be times where we have to follow Jesus right into the test, right into the trial. But I will not turn back. I will be sustained by him, by his body, by his blood. I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to sing this song together and communion is going to be passed among you. Take the bread and drink the cup and remember as we sing. Let's stand, I'll pray, and then uh, we'll celebrate communion.